This is Crosscut Reports. I'm Malia Hasayed. Today, we're revisiting the summer of 2020 through the eyes of activists who protested against police brutality in Seattle. In May 2020, Minneapolis police killed George Floyd, a black man whose death sparked nationwide protests and demands for accountability in law enforcement. In the days following Floyd's murder, protesters took to the streets of Seattle and, eventually, occupied part of the city's Capitol Hill neighborhood for almost a month. Called Chaz, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. In this episode, we speak with Jadine Radok Kapahug, Crosscut's Emerging Journalist Fellow, about her conversations with Seattle area activists, including their experiences from that summer, what their lives look like today, and what they still think needs to change. For this story, you spoke with a couple of different people. Could you tell me a little bit about them, like their names or just anything else that you think would be helpful to know? So the four people I talked to were Garen Payday Payton, Abby Ekinazar, Jelani Howard, and King County Councilmember Gurmai Sahilai. These are people who were here in the Seattle area in the summer of 2020 when the protests around George Floyd's death broke out. What were they all doing that summer, and what was each of their relationships to the protests? So all four of them actually participated in the protests. They told me a bit about their experiences. Some were highly involved, and others took different approaches to be involved in the protests. Everybody each had their own motivations, but they all kind of had the same thing. They had the same goal of wanting to see change and feeling that they were at this tipping point in history where seeing a police officer with their knee on George Floyd's neck kind of pushed them to that tipping point. How did each of them protest or what were some of the different ways that the people who you spoke to protested? Were they involved with some of the really big mass protests and demonstrations that we saw in Capitol Hill or what did protesting look like for them? Garen was part of a youth group called Engage, which wanted to, like the name, engage people outside of their communities to be part of this talk of racial injustice and police accountability. Jelani, Abby, and Councilmember Zahilai, they were all out in the streets. And again, some of them had different levels of participation. Jelani and Abby were involved in some of the protests in Capitol Hill, Abby especially. Abby is one of the 50 plaintiffs that sued the city of Seattle over SPD's actions during the protests, which include using tear gas, pepper spray. The case has been settled for $10 million. Many of the plaintiffs claim the interactions between protesters and police turned violent, resulting in physical and emotional damage. So Abby, it sounded like served in the military. Were they in the Navy? Yes, they served two tours in Afghanistan. It sounded like from your reporting that Abby was comparing some of the scenes that they saw in the Navy to what they experienced while protesting in Seattle that summer. Is that true? They were kind of in shock with the things that they were seeing in the streets. It's it's really hard to think or to fathom, especially as a veteran, Having to fight for my own country in a, a, a different world, you know, um, and then coming back home and having to fight for my right to be a citizen in my own backyard. The terminology that Abby used during our interview to describe what was going on included calling regular people civilians and They had said they saw police and civilians alike wearing, like, tactical gear, like bulletproof vests, things that normally, normal civilians wouldn't really have access to. And they were just kind of shocked about how, you know, comparing the differences between the tours they had done, like, overseas and the things that they had witnessed as a service member. And seeing that here in, you know, like downtown Seattle, where people normally would be shopping or hopping on the light rail to go home or go to work. So yeah, it was a bit daunting for them to see because they felt that they had 
served their time in the military for this country, for freedoms, and to come here and see that there were still some freedoms that they didn't have access to just because they were black um, really hurt and cut, cut deep. I would be curious to hear a little bit more about Garen. You mentioned through Engage that he was marching through the city. Could you tell me a little bit more about Engage, just kind of what their mission was and what Garen was doing with them in 2020? Engage was one of the community groups that led a lot of the large protests that we saw throughout Seattle. And like their name says, Engage is meant to engage people outside of the communities that are normally part of these conversations. And so Garen described it to me. He was saying basically kind of talking with, you know, your suburban yoga moms, trying to get them involved in the conversation and people that normally wouldn't want to or don't know about things that are going on in their city or with other communities. He said that it was a space to allow these youth to really be themselves and to just be out in the streets and have conversations with all types of people, no matter what where they came from or their political beliefs. It sounded like Garen was in the streets protesting and marching for 200 days. Just anecdotally, that feels a lot longer than some of these other protests that we saw that were huge and massive, but seemed quite limited. Do you get the sense that the way that Garen was marching and the length of time that he was marching was relatively longer? And if that is the case, why he was marching for so long? It was a really long time to be out there, but the way that he described it to me was a bit different. He said that if you were in the heat of the moment, then you could feel the energy that everybody had. You could feel all of the pain and grief that people were going through, but as well as like the joy and compassion that they all shared to want to see change. And so I think that's kind of why he got caught up and stayed outside for way longer than most of the protesters did. And I think that's the reason why he wanted to stay out for that long, because he felt to do so, he needed to be out on the streets every day and to show up, just so people knew that this wasn't just a one-and-done kind of deal. Like, it was an ongoing fight, and it still continued even when he had to go back in. And what was his experience like uh, protesting for so long? He said it was the best moment of his life. He Again, he described just being out in the streets, dancing, chanting, being with other people, having conversations, even if they were tough conversations. He got to share a lot about himself and he could feel the passion and energy of people around him and know that he wasn't alone in this fight anymore. And what happened to Engage? Where is it right now? Engage no longer exists. Garen was a little bit vague on where the other members went, kind of how it all went down, but he basically said that people just had different paths that they wanted to take with the group, and that kind of got in the way of things. Tell me a little bit about Jelani and how he kind of got involved with these protests, but it sounds like... It, He's also just been involved in activism for years. What are the origins of that? What kind of mobilized him? So Jelani started way back. And all of the activists have said that activism has always been part of their lives. And it's just certain moments in their life where it really sprung out of them and they wanted to get involved. So in 2016, when Colin Kaepernick decided to take a knee during the national anthem, 49ers quarterback knelt instead of standing during the national anthem at last night's game. He was not alone. Jelani Howard was 17, about to turn 18, a senior at Garfield High School here in Seattle. And he decided with his team and parents and other people that wanted to participate to take a knee during the playing of the national anthem at one of their high school games. And from then, Johnny stayed involved with activism. Like, he was involved in the protests in 2020, lived on Cap Hill, and so he was out there at the height of it. Although he wasn't outside like Garen for 200 days, he was still there for key moments. With this protest, this like kind of nationwide collective protest and all of these smaller protests, they were really big 
and people are continuing to organize and mobilize, but it doesn't, at least as a viewer, feel like it's at all at the scale that it was in 2020. And I wonder if anyone who you spoke to touched on that, like this sense of fatigue or if they feel that people have gotten apathetic about the cause. Yeah. Did anyone talk about that? Yeah. Um, across the board, I would say that Garen and Abby kind of felt really exhausted with everything that was kind of going on or the change that they weren't seeing happening. And especially Garen being outside for 200 out of the 365 days in a year, it takes a toll on a person. And he was going through some personal things as well, moving apartments and just not resting or eating properly. He said that after being outside for that long, he needed to take like a year long in order to recover from all of the activities that had gone down and all of the, you know, adrenaline that was pumping the entire time he was outside. For Abby, I think just going out there and seeing the level of violence that they had experienced took a toll on them as well. And this lawsuit has been a long time coming for them. Um, and even then, like Abby said that the city's city statement to not own up to the police department's actions during the protests also hit a nerve. The city of Seattle admits no wrongdoing in the case. Regarding the settlement, city attorney Ann Davison said this decision was the best financial decision for the city considering risk, cost, and insurance. And when you talk to some of these people, how do they reflect on that summer now? Do they look back at the protests any differently than they did at the time? Or what do they remember from that time and, and how do they feel about it four years later? There was a lot of mixed emotions when it comes to how they felt about the protests. Garen said that the protests were the best moment of his life. You know, Abby was one of the 50 plaintiffs that sued because they had to receive medical treatment for months after due to um, the tear gas and their asthma kind of acting up after that. Council member Zahilai was out in the streets and he was participating, having conversations with his constituents and getting to know a lot of their concerns. Gurmai Zahilai, he's someone who it sounds like considers himself an activist, but he is also a politician. And so he balances both of these roles and he started his term, you know, fairly close to around the time of these protests. And he's just worked in his community. It sounds like his objectives, some of the things that he wants to work on have changed in that time because of the protests. Yeah. So when he first got elected to this position, he thought that he would be focusing on a lot more like big changes like climate change having to do with housing. I mean, he still obviously focuses on some of those, but he says now that at during that time, it was a really it was a really trying period for everybody and he just wanted to help people survive. That's the words that he said. And so that's kind of like the approach he takes now. What can we do here in this community and in this area in this region before like thinking like the, you know, big picture? How do they reflect on the past four years? Do they feel like things have improved? Do they feel like that they've stayed kind of the same? Yeah, that's whenever when I ask them that question, a lot of them had a lot of different answers. Um, I would say it's more of like a gray area because there is some change. There are some changes that a lot of them have acknowledged and are grateful for. I do love that the city city's art commission, their creative initiative especially when it comes to providing grants and funding for BIPOC or underrepresented programs, you know, that are happening throughout Washington state um, is a beautiful change that I thought would never, ever happen. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that they feel haven't changed or that need still need to change. And they're, they're not sure at this point where to go. It's one thing, right, that the city has going for it. I don't see anything else happening. A lot of them were exhausted from having to do the work that they do, but overall, all of them felt proud of their actions and kind of some of the things that came out of it. Do they all still kind of 
maintain their activism? And if so, what does that look like for each of them? Yeah, I would say all of them, while some of them aren't actively out there protesting, mobilizing every single day, they still call themselves activists. In Garen's case, he said he channels his activism now through his art. He's a musician, he has a podcast, and he wants to talk more about kind of what happened with other Black creatives here in the city. And not just Black creatives, but other people of color artists. The way Abby channels their activism today is similar to Garen's. They have said that they're planning to do a couple more documentaries because they're a filmmaker, but they're really highly involved in the community as well as standing up for other movements. Jelani is still really active. I mean, he speaks sometimes at Garfield High School. He's given advice to the Seattle Mariners for this youth program that they have on mentoring youth of color. When you talk to them, did they say explicitly some of the things that they still want to see change in Seattle? Were there any takeaways? So Garen did talk a bit about, you know, how he saw less police on the streets in some areas and that there have been a lot of changes since the protests. However, a lot of them still feel like there's a lot more work to be done. Jelani was saying that... He's a little bit on the fence about defunding the police just because he wants to be sure to know where the money is like really allocated to. Abby says that they haven't seen any kind of significant changes because I think there was a case where an SPD officer had hit a girl. Kondula was in the crosswalk when she was hit by the patrol car that was going 63 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. It does not seem like there's a criminal investigation going on. Abby particularly talked about this case, and they had said that, you know, just seeing that after everything that had happened since and all the protests, it just showed that there wasn't that much significant change. And one thing I wanted to just circle back to, I think you had mentioned that, you know, you have a few different people who participated in these protests and defunding the police was kind of at the heart of this. But four years later, you talk to a couple of activists and they have different ideas or maybe they're not exactly on the same page about this really core issue. What what do you make of that? I mean, at the end of the day, everybody can come in with the same like idea and the same motivation, but sometimes everybody will take a different path. Um, You know, some of them are on the fence about it. Some of them are fully for it. And that just kind of shows that, like, we're not all like one monolith. Some of these activists have different ways of channeling their activism or showing up. Um, Some people have a certain capacity. And I think that's just something to um, keep in mind when we're, we're thinking of activists. They're not all the same. And especially when it comes to activism and their journeys, they look very, very different. Thanks for listening to Crosscut Reports. This episode was reported by Jadine Radak Kabahug. It was produced by Sarah Bernard and me, Maliha Sayed. The story editor was Ryan Famuliner. Our executive producer is Sarah Menzies. You can subscribe to Crosscut Reports wherever you listen. And whatever platform you're listening on, please review us. We'd love to know what you think of the show. Also, if you would like to support the work we do at Crosscut, whether it's our lineup of podcasts, the video docuseries we stream every week, or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to the on-demand programming of Seattle's PBS station, KCTS 9. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. That's also where you'll find a text version of the story we discussed today. Crosscut Reports is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Maliha Sayed. We'll be back soon with another episode.